Hey everybody, and welcome to another Bible study on Love Letters from an Old Man, study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Today we'll be beginning 1st John chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. This will be our final video Bible study before we're able to be back together. Now those of you that aren't going to be able to be with us on Sunday mornings, you'll still be able to watch the video of that Bible class. It will be uh, available to you online the same way that these videos have been available. But for those of you that have been looking forward to being back together for Bible class, it's good news. Uh, we will be back together beginning next week and starting with 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And then we will uh, do verses 7 through 21 of 1 John 4 next week. And then... We'll be into 1 John 5, and then 2 John, and 3 John. And then in the month of December, we will begin a new quarter with new Bible class teachers. Now, if you will open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, our lesson for today is about testing false teachers. Let's read that together. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. Ye are of, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we're going to break this up into three points, much like we would with a sermon. And the first of those is the command to test. Look at verse 1 again. It says, "Believe, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, it is a solemn fact that God has, throughout every generation, commanded His people to test whether or not teachers were true teachers or false teachers. And that's a solemn fact because false teachers have always existed. The first of them you can find in Genesis chapter 3 when the devil himself teaches falsely to Eve and she listens and she gets into trouble. Well, let's see what Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 through 5 says. We'll look at a couple references from Deuteronomy and then we'll move to the New Testament. Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 through 5, <clears throat> Moses said this, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder cometh to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to trust thee, to thrust thee, excuse me, out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, thou shalt so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of you. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. So the test, according to what Moses said in Deuteronomy 13, is when they prophesy about a future event, does it come to pass or not? And they were told to go so far as to uh, put to death those false teachers that tried to lie and say that they had a prophecy from God. Now, that's the way that things worked in the Old Testament prophets prophesied and so anyone who had a word from God was a prophet and if he spoke of a future event it either came to pass and proved that he was true 
or it didn't come to pass and prove that he was false. Now look at Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 through 22. It says, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So again, if the prophet said that something was going to come to pass and it didn't come to pass, that proved that that prophet was not speaking in accordance with the word of God. Uh, and also, if they were speaking in the name of another God, that was another guarantee that they were a false prophet. Now let's go to the New Testament and look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Matthew seven, fifteen through 20. It says this, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorn, of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So when Jesus spoke of false teachers, he told us that we can examine their fruit. And we'll circle back around to that idea in a minute. But the fruit of their teaching or the fruit of the way that they live their lives is an indication of whether or not they are a true teacher of the gospel or not. And so we can examine what is the fruit of this gospel that you're teaching? What is the fruit of this doctrine that you're spreading? Is it good or is it bad? And we'll get into that in just a minute. Now look at Acts chapter 17 verse 11. Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says this, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. That's talking about the Berean church. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. It says this, In that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So the Berean Christians were more noble than the Thessalonian Christians. Thessalonian Christians were great Christian people. But the Berean Christians showed their nobility in the eyes of God uh, because they, when they heard anything, any kind of teaching, they went and they searched the scriptures to see whether or not it was so. Uh, they had at that time uh, definitely the Old Testament available to them and likely some of the New Testament books that they could take whatever was taught to them and they could check it with what had already been revealed from God, and they could see whether or not it was so. Now, you and I have not the ability to prophesy, and nobody does. You and I do not have uh, a miraculous endowment of figuring out who's right and who's wrong, but what you and I do have is the Word of God, and we can check it just like those Berean Christians did. That's why uh, Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, "...prove all things, hold fast that which is good." So in other words, check what you're being taught with the Word of God. If what I'm teaching you isn't what God's Word says, then I need to be called out on that, and you don't need to believe me. So you need to be checking to make sure that what I teach, or what Barry teaches, or what any other of our Bible class teachers teach, or what anybody else that you ever have teach you the gospel teaches you, you need to be checking behind them in the Word of God to make sure it is so. I remember... Uh, one, one example that always stands out to me is that of the Ethiopian eunuch that we read about uh, in Acts chapter uh, 8. Uh, no, not 8. Yeah, Acts chapter 9, excuse me. Uh, that uh, when he's traveling home uh, and he's heading home from worship, he's heading home from the temple, from from worshiping God, he's reading the book of Isaiah trying to figure out what it says. And that's when Philip joins himself to the Ethiopian eunuch there and he teaches him the gospel. And so that example always stands out to me as someone who's leaving church still thinking about the lesson that they were taught. They're leaving the assembly and thinking about, well, what does this Bible passage 
really mean rather than just saying whatever my preacher said, that's what I believe. And so it's important for us to do that. Now, I do want to point out, and a lot of people say, well, we can't be judgmental, right? We're not supposed to judge people. And so when it comes to teachers of false doctrine, a lot of people say, well, you know, we can just let that be because we don't know what's right or what's wrong and we can't be a judge over them. But I want you to know when we look at Matthew chapter 7 that the same passage that tells us not to be judges tells us to be fruit inspectors. We just noticed it a minute ago. Look at Matthew chapter 7. We'll start with verses 1 through 6, then we'll go on down. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So, a lot of people will take verse 1 of Matthew chapter 7 and say, well, we can't judge what's right and what's wrong. All we can do is do the best we can and leave the rest of it uh, to God to sort out. And to a certain extent, I would agree with that. I'm not anyone's judge, and so when I stand before the Lord in judgment, I answer for me, and someone else answers for them, and it's not my job to be the judge. But I can ascertain from Scripture whether or not something is right or something is wrong. This same passage that told us, judge not that you be not judged, told us, gave us this example that we would be judged in the same way that we judge, and says, that if we have a beam in our eye, we shouldn't bother with getting the mote out of someone else's eye until we get the beam out of ours. But then it goes on to tell us that we ought not um, give what is holy unto dogs, which would mean that we have to discern what's holy and, and, and what the dogs are. Uh, and then it says we shouldn't cast our pearls before swine. So it's telling us to figure out what the pearls are and figure out what the swine are. So there is discernment taking place here in Matthew chapter 7, even though we're told not to judge. Now, skip down to verses 15 through 20, and we've already read those verses about wolves in sheep's clothing, which means that we have to ascertain what is a wolf and what is a sheep. And it tells us that by their fruits, we shall know them. It says that you're not going to gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles. Well, you're figuring out what thorns are, you're figuring out what thistles are, you're figuring out what figs are, you're figuring out what grapes are. There is discernment in this passage, and we're told to discern. The great brother Marshall Keeble, that uh, is a preacher that's gone on to his reward, used to say, I am not a judge, but I am a fruit inspector. And you and I are to look at the fruit of false teaching and determine whether it's true or it's false. Because God's revealed to us what's true and what's false. Now, there are matters of opinion, and there are ways in which we do not know the heart of individuals. We do not know what they do in private. But if something is said publicly from a pulpit or written down in some form of writing or published on a video on the internet, we can say that's right or that's wrong. You know, we can we can discern those things, we can figure those things out, and we ought to stand against that false teaching. Uh, it would be just a heinous and awful thing to know there was a wolf among sheep and not warn the sheep. And so we are told to speak out against false teaching. We are told to address that false teaching uh, in, in an appropriate manner. Uh, now, John chapter 7, verse 24, will clear a little bit of that up for us. It says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's what we're talking about, folks. We're not saying, well, uh, let me just glance at the appearance of things. Like, this man seems to be very holy, so whatever he says, I'm going to listen to. Uh, the Pharisees would have gotten away with a lot of that in the first century. Uh, we likewise shouldn't say, well... There's something that seems, uh, something I don't like about this individual, so everything they say is wrong. We should instead 
go to the Word of God and judge righteous judgment. Okay, so that is uh, our first point from verse 1 on the command to test. We are commanded to test teachers to figure out whether they're teaching the truth or teaching falsehood. Now, the second uh, area that we're going to study is the criteria for testing. We're going to see that in verses 2 and 3. It says this, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. The false teaching that was being addressed at the time that John wrote this was a false teaching known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism, um, gnosko, uh, means to know. The Gnostics felt like they knew more than everybody else, and they tried to spread around their new knowledge to everybody else. And a lot of that entailed not uh, believing that the flesh was completely wicked and that there was no way for someone to be in the flesh and not sin. Uh, But then they also, because of that, drew a line in the sand as to the deity and the fleshliness of Jesus. Did he come in the flesh? Was he God in the flesh? And some Gnostics said, well, he was God, but he never came in the flesh. He, He just appeared to come in the flesh. Others said that he was a human being in the flesh, and he never was God. And so in either one of those cases, they were either denying the deity of Jesus or they were denying the humanity of Jesus. And so that was the big problem of their day. And John addresses that here. And he says, here's a quick and easy way for you to figure out who's a false teacher and who's not. If anybody denies that Jesus the Christ came in the flesh, they're not of God. If anyone uh, says that he is the Christ and has come in the flesh, then they are of God. You see, that was an easy way for them to discern the difference between that false doctrine and the true doctrine. Now, he did say that those that denied the deity of Jesus and that denied that he came in the flesh and that he died and that he rose again, those people he referred to as antichrist. Now, we talked about that a couple lessons ago. I encourage you to go back and find the lesson on overcoming the antichrist. I think that's an important study. Uh, and and we'll mention that here in just a minute, just just to go back to what First John two said about it. But here he defines what that is. Uh, an antichrist is a person who denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's it. Uh, anyone who is anti or against Jesus Christ. Now let's ask the question for a minute. Why is that important? Why is it important that we recognize that Jesus Christ came? died and rose again. Well, John talked about, or excuse me, Paul talked about what makes that so important in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, because some of these folks were denying the resurrection, denying that a resurrection ever took place, and so, or that you and I would ever be resurrected. So Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, he says this, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, that is, if you and I aren't going to be resurrected from the dead, then is Christ not risen? Because Jesus Christ is our uh, our guarantee of a resurrection. All right, he, he continues on. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye, and yet, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If you believe that Jesus Christ, first of all, is not deity, or if you believe that he did not come in the flesh, or if you believe that he did not die on the cross for us, or if you believe that he did not rise from the dead, then Paul says you are of all men most miserable. 
if we don't have that hope, if we don't have that hope of eternal life, when we don't have that hope of a resurrection in Jesus, then what do we have? Uh, it, it's just a miserable idea to consider. John began his gospel account and this letter that we've been studying, both of them with a testament that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And it's important for us to notice that. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then down in verse 14, it says this, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John said there was the word. This is, uh, this is someone who is equal with God, the creator of the world. And then he says he came in the flesh and we saw him. We beheld him. We, we noticed. We were there. And then he says this in First John <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, he's talking about Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John began both of these writings with the notion that God came in the flesh and John was there to witness it. And he speaks to us as an eyewitness against those who would teach otherwise. Those that would say, oh well, Jesus never came. Or God never came in the flesh, that was just some man. Or, oh no, he never died for us, or he never rose from the dead. John stands in opposition to that. His writing is primarily focused on overcoming that notion. And we see that in his gospel account. We see that here in 1 John as well. Now again, like I said, antichrist means against Christ. 1 John 2.18 says, Little children... It is the last time, and ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. We know that uh, God has uh, revealed uh, to us the difference between those that follow him and those that don't. He calls those that do not believe in Jesus, that stand in opposition to Jesus, as Antichrist. And he tells us that there are many of them. There were many of them in John's day. And let's not kid ourselves. There are even more of them today. Those that do not believe in Jesus Christ stand in opposition to him. Whether they be atheists, whether they be Muslims, whether they be uh, any other false religion in the world. And there are some that call themselves Christians that sadly are antichrist. They're against Jesus. They're against what the Bible reveals to us as truth. Now let's get into our third and final section of the scripture, the completion of the test. We're told to test. We're told the criteria for that test. Uh, does someone believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh or not? And now 1 John 4 verses 4 through 6 is our completion of the test. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He tells us quite plainly, folks, that we have overcome. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? What the world has not recognized is that we as Christians have already overcome the world because we're trusting in the one who's already won. When you read the book of Revelation, which is another writing of the Apostle John, the whole message of the book is that Jesus wins... Everybody else just hasn't figured that out yet. Uh, that applied in the Romans' day. That also applies to us today. The world thinks it's one. Uh, and the devil, in many ways, has overtaken this world. And there are so many souls that are lost. There are 
so many that are lost and don't even know about Jesus. There are others that are lost in some false Christianity. And here we are on the side of the one who's already overcome. God is greater than Satan, and we have to trust in God. And if we'll trust in God, then we're already on the winning team. Now, it's also a guarantee that there are false teachers in the world. That they're in the world, they're of the world, and the world loves them. Those that are loved by the world are definitively those that are not doing what's right. Because if we're doing what's right, we're going to be opposed by those that do wrong. We're told that the darkness hates the light. John 15 verses 18 and 19 reads this. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world listens to those that are of the world. The world listens to the opinions that agree with its sin. But you and I stand in opposition to that because we stand on the side of Jesus. We, if we are teaching the truth, are of God. We are on God's side and we are told that we will overcome when this life is over. And so I hope that's a comfort to you when it comes to discerning between truth and error, when it comes to standing out, standing up against that error that's in the world and standing for what's right even when it's difficult. Thank you for tuning in today. I love you. God bless.